Luke 16, starting at verse 1. Page 875. Well, okay, I'm sorry. Page, sorry, you were on this. <laughs> <laughs> Page 875. Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, you will, who, who will entrust you to the, the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve, to serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Steve. Last week, we explored the most famous parable of all the parables, the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and this week we come to the least well-known parable of all the parables. <laughs> Last week it was so well-known that we know all the contours of the story. Even people who are not Christians have heard about the prodigal son coming home. But nobody's heard the parable of the shrewd manager. And actually I reckon in a lot of churches I wonder whether... I mean I haven't preached on this for about 30 years. <laughs> um, I preached on it, I remember, when I first went to the church that I was a pastor of in Suffolk, and, and I was, it was hard work then, and it's been hard work this week to prepare it as well. I think it's been mostly ignored by Christians down the centuries, and yet, it is intimately connected with the parable of the prodigal son. It's almost like the story doesn't stop at the end of chapter 15. Well, the story does, it's replaced by another parable, but but you notice that chapter 16 says, he also said to the disciples. So it's, it's thrown in with all those other parables. It belongs with them and it's developing the theme um, of the whole story. And he's flowing from one parable to the next and saying very similar things. The parable of the prodigal son is the story of a wasteful son. He's been prodigal. He's been wasteful. Uh, he throws away other people's money. Um, the parable of the dishonest manager is the parable of a wasteful manager. He has been throwing away his master's money. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. This man was wasting the rich man's possessions. Um, the, the, there is a strong connection between the two parables. Then, when the prodigal son gets to the far country and he's wasted his money, he comes back and he throws himself upon the mercy 
of his father. And the shrewd manager, when he knows he's going to lose his job, he throws himself, as we shall see, on the mercy of his master. Both of them receive that mercy. The, the, the father of the prodigal son, he does not punish his son for what he's done when he comes home. And the rich man, what, what could he have done? He could have thrown this um, man into jail. He, he could have thrown this dishonest manager into jail, but he doesn't do that. He's gracious with him. So I think what's going on here is that while the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost or prodigal son are all setting out for us this idea of um, God's grace, this parable, the parable of the shrewd manager, is picking up the idea of grace and it's taking it further. How does God's grace work out in life? You know, if you are received by God on the basis of his grace, how does that change the way that you live? And there's another difference that's important. The parable of the prodigal son was entirely focused and grounded in this life. The prodigal came home, he was welcomed, he received God's grace. The parable of the shrewd manager or the dishonest manager um, is, is a parable that goes from grace to glory. He's looking to the last day. It's connecting this life with eternal life, preparing us for the next parable at the end of the chapter, which we'll come to next week, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, which is very much set in eternity. You know, there, it starts in time, but Lazarus dies and the rich man dies as well. Um, so we've got a chapter with, with two rich men, uh, but the, the parables are different, and, and the journey is from grace to glory. The other thing to say is notice that these are parables, all right? The problem for a lot of people when they read their Bibles is that they take everything literally regardless of what kind of writing it is. And these are stories, they're not moral examples for us to follow. A parable is a story that symbolizes something else, okay? It's a picture that tells us about something else. Sometimes Jesus tells us a parable as a contrast. So for example, um, in chapter 18, we're going to come to it in a few weeks' time, the parable of the persistent widow. She's, she's going and knocking on the door of the judge in her community and asking him for a judgment, and he doesn't do anything. He's a terrible judge. He's an unjust judge. And, and Jesus says, look, if she goes and keeps knocking on his door and eventually he gives in, God will answer you. Now, God is not unjust. God is not an incompetent judge. But Jesus is using it as a contrast, isn't he? There's the friend at midnight who comes knocking on the door for bread. Oh, I've got some people who've turned up late and I haven't got anything to give them. Can you give me some of your bread? And the man in the house says, I'm sorry, we're all in bed and we've gone to sleep and you've woken me up. And I imagine that he wasn't too pleased. <laughs> Please don't use the parable of the friend at midnight as an excuse to come knocking on our door at midnight unless someone's in hospital, all right? We'll come then. <laughs> If you ask us for a pint of milk at midnight, um, yeah, don't use that as a moral example. Most of all, the parable of the burglar. The parable of the burglar? Nobody ever thinks about the parable of the burglar. But Jesus likens himself to a burglar in chapter 11, verse 21 and 22. He describes a burglar breaking into a rich man's house. And what does the burglar do? He ties up the rich man. And once he's tied him up, he can take all his goods, can't he? And Jesus says, do you know what, that's a brilliant picture of what I've done with Satan. Jesus is not saying, become a burglar like me. You do not moralize, yeah? Okay, so these are not a moral example. They're there to teach us a spiritual lesson. I've labored that point, but I think it's important. Let's get to the story, shall we? There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him, that is, to the rich man, that this man was wasting his possessions. <clears throat> a rich man, it sounds like he's a banker, doesn't it? And that people borrow money from him. It's not actually like that because there's a little clue in the story. The rich man, so we're led to believe it, is, is the landowner in the village. He owns the village or the town and the, the fields around it. He's a very rich man. And lots of people rent his land from him. And he employs a manager to sort them all out. The manager is paid a fee for every tenancy that he sets up. Um, he organizing the, organizes the renting out of the land to various farmers. He's in charge of all that land. 
and they agree a rent that would be paid at harvest time in produce. Because in the parable, that's what they do, isn't it? They are owing olive oil, they're owing wheat. So they're, they're the kind of people who owe until harvest time. And then they pay their rent in, in produce. So one man, he has a, a, a hillside planted with olive trees. What is his currency? His currency is olive oil. So he's going to pay his annual rent at harvest time when he's crushed his olives and made his oil. And uh, he agrees how much olive oil he is going to pay. And they write it down and they put it on a piece of paper and it's important and it's got their signatures on it. And it's agreed and they can both, maybe they both have a copy of that piece of paper. I don't know. <clears throat> There's another farmer, he's got fertile soil and he, he grows wheat. And so he's going to pay his rent in wheat, in grain. And they can only pay when the harvest comes in. Now, the rich man, the landowner, um, he employs the manager to run the estate. And what, during the year, not at harvest time, but some other time during the year, the word get, gets back to the rich man. Do you know what your manager is doing? Your manager is, you know, messing up your estate big time. Maybe, you know, there's some of the land that he hasn't rented out. I don't know. Or maybe he's taken it for himself and had a party there and ruined it. Or, or, or he's, you know, he's blocked up the ditches and the land is flooding and being ruined and all, 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 all sorts of things are going wrong. <clears throat> the word gets back to him that his manager has been prodigal, wasteful with the owner's possessions. We don't know what he's done, but what we do know is it's a sacking offence. He's on his way. Now, normally, in that situation, the, the, the rich man would have a right to have him arrested. You know, he's, you, sometimes it happens at work, doesn't it? Someone's had been found out for fraud. If they're kind, they'll sack them and let them go, but they might not. They might just you know, invite the police into the office, mightn't they? And the person goes out in handcuffs. But that is not what the rich man does. Considering the circumstances, he's very, very gracious. Look at what he says in verse 2. He called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. Now what he's done there is he's given the manager a little window of opportunity to get busy. The manager has been told to go around all the farms and collect all the bills, all the books, and bring them back to, the, to the, uh, the owner. And the owner doesn't know what's written on those pieces of paper, we assume. So he sits and he thinks to himself, I mean, it must have been a terrible day for him, yeah? You are gonna have to, you can no longer be manager. Those are the words he never wanted to hear. So verse three, he thinks to himself, what shall I do? My master is taking the management away from me. I am not strong enough to dig. I couldn't rent a piece of land and dig it and farm it. I'm too fat and too unfit and not capable at my age of doing that. I'm ashamed to beg. <laughs> He's been the man of power, the man about town, hasn't he? The idea of him sitting with a begging bowl outside the town is, is just unthinkable. How can he go round the town begging? Then he has a cunning plan. I have decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. He realises that the fateful day has come. So often people who've got their hand in the till, they know it's going to end, don't they? They feel guilty about what they're doing and they can't actually allow it to carry on. They hope in the end that they get caught. And that day has come, his winning streak has ended, he's been found out, he's about to be left destitute. So his clever move is to make some quick friends. Friends that he has managed. Friends that haven't had a very nice opinion of him. You know, all these people he's been charging high rents to, they look on him as a bit of a grim character, don't they? And, and suddenly he needs to change their attitude. So he goes to each farmer, each debtor, each tenant in turn, and the first man, at harvest time, he's going to have to pay a hundred measures of oil. And verse 6, he says to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Scrub out a hundred and write 50. Wow, a 
50% reduction in his rent. Uh, and you can sense that he's in a hurry. Do it quickly. Come on, we've got to get on. I need the piece of paper. Let me take it with me. Find the piece of paper and let's write it down. The next man owes a hundred measures of wheat and the manager cuts it by 20%. Can you see the clever move here? The rich man in his manor house doesn't have a copy of all these bills. At least that's how I imagine it. It's not entirely explained, but he doesn't have a copy of all the bills. That They're in the heads of the, the manager, the head of the manager and, and all the farmers. And therefore, whoever's got the piece of paper has the power. The landowner said, turn in the account of your management, but he had no idea what the books were going to show. He's left his manager to do all the dealing. Not only that, the rich man has actually already been gracious. He's been kind to this man, to the manager, by not clapping him in irons and walking him off to jail. Yeah? By not putting him under arrest and calling in the police, he's actually been rather gracious, as managers often are in those circumstances. Now the manager thinks, hmm, my master is a gracious man. He's been gracious to me, Maybe he'll be gracious to the tenants as well. I will mark down what his tenants owe him, and he will graciously accept it. When the bills come into the rich man's house, and he sees that several of them have been marked down, discounted considerably, what will he do? Well, very soon, the news is getting around the village that in his going... The manager has made a lot of people very happy. <laughs> Suddenly, this manager is rather popular. He's made himself a lot of friends. And all the tenant farmers are suddenly speaking well of him. What's been going on here? But here's the surprise. What would you have done if you were the rich man in that situation? Would you have pulled up all those pieces of paper and scrubbed out the discount and put in the original price? Because <laughs> that was your right. That was what they'd agreed to pay. You, know, you could have gone back to the letter of the law, couldn't you? But he doesn't do that. He is gracious. And Jesus said, Jesus says, verse 8, and this is the point of the parable. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. The manager had a shrewd eye for the future. And the future affected what he did in the present. And Jesus says these mysterious words, verse 8, For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Let me read that again. It's a strange comment, isn't it? The sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Jesus is setting up a contrast here between light and darkness. The sons of light, the sons of darkness, between heaven and earth, uh, between time and eternity. All of those things are going to come out in these final verses. And he uses this phrase, unrighteous wealth. Now, in the older translations, that's called the mammon of unrighteousness. And that's a phrase that's kind of, well, in my generation, it had come down into the language. I don't know whether that's true for all of you, but... You know, people look at, you know, million pound salaries in the city and talk about it as the mammon of unrighteousness and so on. Um, to describe the worldly wealth uh, of people. In contrast to the riches of eternal life that can never perish, spoil or fade. So there's, there's sort of heavenly and unrighteous. There is, there is a suggestion here that it's, it's, it's unrighteous in the sense that there's something about wealth... Um, that, you know, we're not entirely sure how we came about our wealth and how we came to be as we are. Um, here in verse 8, he's teaching us uh, that sometimes when it comes to dealing with wealth in this life, unbelieving people in this world around us can be more shrewd and more far-sighted in the way that they use their wealth than, than Christians can. In matters of everyday business, they think ahead a bit better. Do you know people who are in business? And you know they have thought ahead better than you have. Yeah, they have an eye 
for the future. And we tend to be very short-sighted and taken up with getting through the day, don't we? And Jesus says we can learn from their initiative. People who are astute business people look at the market. They're always looking to see how it's changing. They're always studying their sales. They're always looking to see what, where the demand is. They're watching the competition. They respond to that and they plan accordingly. They're looking at what's happening in the short to medium term future. Now, if that's the way that they handle money and business and the short to medium term, here's the big question. How do we handle eternity? How does it shape our lives? We live between God's saving grace and his coming glory. Yeah? God's grace has saved us. If we're Christians, we've experienced God's grace, just like the prodigal son, just like this manager has experienced grace at the hands of the, the owner, the, the, the rich man. We've experienced God's grace, and we live between that day and the day when we're going to die, and we're going to face God in his holy glory. Or, indeed, the day when Jesus returns, which may be sooner. Um, and we have received God's saving grace. So does that show in our lives? And how should we be living out God's grace in our lives as we head towards that day of glory? Now, I believe that that's key to all the sayings that follow um, in, in verses 9 to 13. Jesus, if you like, unpacks the parable with some very, very punchy sayings. And we're going to take them verse by verse. First of all, verse 9. He says, And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Jesus says, it is unrighteous wealth. You know, inevitably, some of the ways that we become rich are not righteous, that they are unjust. Um, there's not time to go into that today. It's a very politically correct thing to uh, you know, advise and, and discuss today, isn't it? That, that the wealth of the West has been built up through the, the slave trade and through empire. Um, I think we also need to recognize it's been, having built up all that wealth, we've kind of made ourselves a, a protectionist fortress and nobody can sell their goods into our market, so we protect our own industries. Um, you know, we've built up a lot of wealth, often at the expense of other people. And we want to buy cheap garments from sweatshops that people have been paid almost nothing to make and so on. We have got rich, haven't we, at the expense of others. But you know what? In, in, in the 30 years that I've been in ministry, the standard of living has gone up so high. Look, look at all the housing of Didcot. Look at the little two up, two downs at the bottom of the Broadway, the railway cottages that were built here all those oh, 100 plus years ago. Um, look at all the 20, early 20th century council houses in Kiniston Road and the post-war concrete ones in Queensway and the, the, the bungalows and the 60s houses beyond them and, and all those houses around Brazenose. And, and then came Lady Grove. That was a little better, wasn't it? And then came Great Western Park. And one day the Valley Park houses are going to make our houses look a bit bland, aren't they? You know, it's, that's the way it's been going for so long, a steady inexorable rise in standards of living. Do we fit into, um, I've lost my place, I beg your pardon. It's getting so eloquent about the architecture of Didcot that I lost my place in my notes. <clears throat> the question Jesus puts to us is this. Yes, wealth has gone up. We are far better off than our parents' generations were. But how do we use the wealth that God has given us? Do we use the gifts that he has given us to advance his kingdom? Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 3, What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And I think Christians often struggle with the idea of money and possessions, don't we? Um, at one extreme, we hate money. We call it filthy lucre and uh, you know, unrighteous wealth, as Jesus calls it here. We try to avoid the subject of money as much as possible. And then other Christians can be really obsessed with it, can't they? 
Uh, whether it's the prosperity gospel preacher who's promising everybody that if they trust him and have enough faith, they too can be rich and all the rest of it. Or the clergyman who's always banging on about how the church roof is going to be repaired, you know, and they're always appealing for money and money becomes the dominant narrative. Jesus calls us to a third way. Jesus says, see the gifts that you have in this life as a gift from a gracious God. And they're to be used for gospel purposes. We have a home. So do we use it to welcome friends and, and make it a welcoming place where people love to come? And we want them to see Christ in us. We're not house proud. We want to share a meal with people who can't re return the compliment. Um, we want to welcome them just as Christ has welcomed us. And we want to give money to advance the cause of God's kingdom. We want to see the kingdom extend here in Didcot and across the country and across Europe and across the world. We want the church to be able to invest in people who can take the work of the gospel forwards. But what's the motivation for such generosity? The motivation is that one day that will fail, all that money. Do you notice that in verse 9? Make friends of yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, because it will be gone, we can't take it with us. When our life comes to an end, and we've left the wealth we had in the past tense for others, will there be those that we have reached with the gospel who welcome us into eternal dwelling? Will there, be, will there be people there waiting and thankful that somebody put a Gideon Bible in their hotel room? Waiting and thankful that you took the trouble to talk to them on the streets or you took the trouble to invite them to a welcome Sunday or, or whatever it might be. We are in the business of populating heaven and that is our final home. It's where our citizenship is established. That's the first great statement here. Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Second statement, verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Money is of very little value. It can quickly turn to vapour. We put £100 into the Bradford and Bingley Building Society because we heard it might be going in, turning into a PLC and we'd get a windfall. And we got our windfall, it was stayed in the account. And the Bradford and Bingley went bust and we lost the lot. <laughs> Money can turn to nothing. <laughs> As we have discovered, haven't we, so painfully. And we might discover in the months and years to come. Money is only a means to an end. The test for us is how we use it, what we have. Our stewardship of our money and our possessions speaks volumes about our motivations, doesn't it? Are we really people shaped by God's grace? Do we live for ourselves in an entirely self-seeking way? Or do we seek to live with faithfulness and humility to serve others rather than ourselves? Thinking back to, to last week and the uh, prodigal son... The older brother, he'd never grasped his father's grace, had he? Everything he did, he did for himself. He was full of his own self-importance. But if we have grasped the wonders of God's grace, it will flow out in our generosity, in our joy in other people, that we just want to be part of their lives and bless them. So the way we use the gifts that God gives us in this life is a test of our faithfulness and it shows whether we've grasped his grace. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Third, Jesus says, if then you have not been faithful with the unrighteous wealth, who will trust, entrust to you the true riches? And if you've not been faithful with that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? What does Jesus mean by true riches. Well, he's, he's dealing with a difficult subject here, and it, it's the idea that we call rewards in heaven. And I always find this a difficult subject to talk about. I'm sort of edgy about it, because I'm so overwhelmed by the idea of grace. 
Jesus doesn't talk about it very often. He only gives us little hints. But hints that those who have responded to the gospel of, of God's grace, who are saved entirely on the basis of the death of Jesus and his resurrection, those who have been shaped by God's grace and who serve well in this life will be rewarded when they reach eternal life. How that works has, has not really been made clear. Maybe that's a good thing, because if we knew how it worked, we'd try and work the system, wouldn't we? It may be that the reward is not greater riches, but greater responsibility. Ruling in heaven and leading and, and so on and so forth. What we can be clear about is that we are, every one of us, called to live a faithful life in this world. Faithful to God and faithful to others in the way we use our money, our home, our work our time, and all the opportunities that God gives us in, in our daily lives. And if that was mind-boggling enough, let's finish with the acid test. This is where Jesus drives it all home in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It needs to be said, doesn't it? Money and possessions are a dangerous thing. They can create the illusion, and we're brilliant at doing that in this community, create the illusion that this world is our home, that we've arrived. You know, you just look at all the Taylor Wimpy marketing and the, 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 the models smiling happily at each other and the nuclear family around the dinner table. Uh, we can hang on to all that we have. Helen and I like going to visit National Trust properties. We're National Trust members and, and we've done loads of National Trust properties uh, on our Saturdays off and, and so on. Um, they're often beautifully grand houses, aren't they? National Trust properties. You know, the, I think the Beatles' home in Liverpool is about the only three-bed semi that they actually have. Uh, everything is set in a country park, isn't it? You know, um, And they're reeking with history. But the strange thing, much as I love going round a house like that and looking at the artworks and the furniture and hearing the story and so on, as you drive home, you realise that you've been living in the past. And you realise that the people of the past are no longer living. That's why we have the National Trust. The home reflects what they were, and they're gone. And what do they have now? So often they served money, they served themselves, and they were some of the loneliest people ever. Can I say, please don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. But rather, invest everything God gives you for eternity. A treasure in the heavens that does not fail. To use a phrase from elsewhere, from I think it's chapter 13. So many people... Their base camp, if you like, is their home, their career, their pension, their life, their time, their days. And as we all know, so suddenly sometimes, that can all be snatched away from us. What are you devoted to? Are you devoted to God or mammon? Time or eternity? Those that invest in eternity will find that it never, ever fails them. May God bless his word to us this morning. Now, if you're wondering why I didn't, read, uh, didn't preach on verses 14 to 17, um, that's because I've already done that.